Hi, good afternoon, everyone. So let's get started. Hi, my name is Kai Zhu. I will be your instructor for this free Asian math class for this year. So this is a 30-week program, totally free to anyone watching on the YouTube live. So this is the first time that someone will teach you a four-year school-level math totally free to anyone, okay? Um, so a little bit background about myself and why I'm doing this. Um, I'm a parent in Silicon Valley, California. I have two kids. Uh, one is in the eighth grade right now and the other is in the sixth grade. So over the years, I help them with their schoolwork, particularly math and writing. And I'm very unsatisfied about the school math they learn uh, because they attend a public school, which is a charter school here uh, in California. They have to follow the common core curriculum. And I'm not very happy about the current curriculum or the content. So based on my own experience, the school math they learn did not prepare them enough to be at a level which I think will enable them to go to college to study anything significantly um, requiring some math skills, be it engineering, science, or even social science. I don't think the math they learn will really do it for them. So um, I came from China. I went through some quite a rigorous mathematical training when I was a student of your age. Uh, I'm currently a patent lawyer. I did my graduate work here in the United States. Uh, first received a PhD in computer engineering. And then later on, I went to law school to study law. Until this day, I'm a very loyal follower of um, um, mathematical studies, so I'm really a fan of math. That's why I'm very motivated to do something that can help my own kids as well as their fellow students in this country to study some more rigorous and more fun math. And that's just part of the reason, because we are right now at a time where the economy is almost completely based on knowledge. It's no longer based on manufacturing. So in the future, the United States will have to compete against all other countries in a knowledge-based economy. And innovation is the most important thing to generate just higher and higher productivity in our economy. So that means that our workforce must be really well prepared to get more research, more scientific development, more engineering designs. So without a solid mathematical just a, our education, United States won't be competitive in the future. Um, personally, I'm very concerned about this. So I decided to um, just teach this um, free Asian math to anyone who really wants to study math, okay? Uh, this is the uh, first year, and it's a pilot project, to be perfectly honest with you. So I will work with all of you uh, for 30 weeks. We will meet twice a day, uh, twice a week, I'm sorry, on Wednesday and Fridays. Uh, that will be homework. After each uh, lecture, um, just post the same night. Uh, so when you wake up next morning, it should be there on the internet. There will be uh, answers and solutions, but uh, I do plan to eventually add video solutions to those homework problems. But that requires a lot of work. So um, my apology, I cannot do that for this year, but hopefully, this project can continue, and eventually I will make all video solutions for those problems. There is, there is a plan to host a, a Saturday 
enrichment seminar every week. Um, so basically, the free lectures here uh, at the school uh, mass level, which means that we will not do much competition math at all. But on Saturdays, um, I will try to talk about some uh, competition math topics. And the goal is to, you know, it's an enrichment program to help some more advanced students to see just a, a, the big picture of math and learn something that they cannot learn uh, from school math. So let's really get started. Um, I already talked about uh, part of the motivations of my uh, program, but let's talk about a little bit more about uh, why we want this program, Free Asian Math. All right. So first of all, as I mentioned, the public school education, or to a, um, just a um, certain level, including the private school master education, because they they cannot really deviate it too far, far away from the public school education framework. Uh, so the K-12 education system in this country does not do its job. Okay, let's face it, let's be candid. We have a lot of things that need to be uh, either reformed or actually fixed. But for various reasons, it's not that nobody try. Actually, educators in this country, they kept trying. Maybe they tried too many times, too frequently. It just, they never get it fixed. All right. That's just an understatement. I wouldn't say bad words about uh, their effort, but it simply did not work. On the other hand, a lot of Asian countries like China, India, Japan, South Korea, you name it, Singapore, their mass education system have been quite successful. All right. We will just it's hard to think out any particular reason or particular country why they are just they are doing better, but they do have a few common just a, a traits. First of all, the societies in Asia they are very positive toward math education, right? In this country, math unfortunately is a low priority. The most popular kids in school are no, not those who can excel in math. They are those who excel in sports. That's a fact, right? If you are too good in math, you will be actually kind of marked as a nerd or even Asian nerd, which is totally unfair and quite frankly, stupid. Why would anyone mock at you if you are academically Excellent. That just doesn't make any sense whatsoever. So the society in Asia, they generally encourage kids to excel in math. And also they have a very good, well compensated uh, education workforce. In general, teachers in Asian countries, their societal standards is quite high. On the other hand, in this country, well, teachers are generally underpaid. You know, doctors, lawyers, they make big money. But it's very sad that our teachers, especially in some states, not all states, but at least I think more than 50% of those teachers are kind of underpaid. That, of course, is directly related to how people perceive math education. Okay, uh, it seems that I have some internet issue. I got a warning here. YouTube is not receiving enough video um, because we are live. I hope this is okay. Um, anyway, we will continue. So those Asian countries, they also have excellent textbooks and homework exercises. Uh, usually, the country has a, each country 
has a national committee or just kind of special government agency who just is in charge of textbook and the curriculum. In this country, it's a chaos. We do have something called Common Core. We, I will talk, talk about that shortly, but it's simply, it's a chaos, okay? So, Asian countries have very successful models, and I came from China. I basically know how the systems, uh, including China's, how the system there work. One of the major components of their education system is that students will need to work a lot of homework problems. That's very, very, very important. In math, you just don't read the books or attend the lectures, then all of a sudden you know how to do math. You have to work on a lot of problems. Practice, they are super important. If you don't practice enough, no matter how smart you are, you won't be good at the math. Let me tell you a very personal story, all right? I actually, I had the fortune, or bad fortune, to go to college at a very early age. I went to college when I was 14. The reason for that was that somehow my teachers put me into a program where I spent just one year to finish all my high school study. Somehow I was able to do that like a few other uh, fellow kids who were in that program. And I successfully passed the college entrance exam. So I was able to attend college at a, a very young age. But unfortunately, you know, there's no free lunch. I just spent one year to finish a three year curriculum, how possibly I got a very solid training. I'm no genius, right? I'm just a regular student, maybe a little bit better in terms of my IQ, maybe, just maybe. But I could not possibly really just spend one year to beat other people three years. That would be ridiculous. So as it turned out, before high school, my mathematical skills were well uh, you know, honed. I really had a quite solid base before high school. But in high school, I took a huge shortcut, go to college, and that created a lot of problems. It was not until much later when I was in graduate school, I realized what I missed, and I had to spend extra time to fix the earlier problem. And part of the reason that is that you cannot do sufficient exercise problem in that one year just super fast, expedited, just curriculum, right? You just don't have time to do all the problems. I wasn't able to beat the exams, but that's just very superficial. So doing homework is very important. No matter how smart you are, if you don't put in your work, you won't be able to be good at math. That's super, super important. So all those kids, Asian countries, they provide some thing that we can borrow from and that we can learn from, and that's the major motivation behind this uh, program, all right? So what are the major differences between American and those Asian curriculums? That have a lot of to do with the tradition in this country, and we will talk about Common Core shortly. Essentially, in America, some Concepts are repeated again and again across multiple years under the theory that in that way students can gradually learn the subject or the topics better and better and with a solid understanding at the end. But to my knowledge, no other country, no advanced, no other advanced country in this world is actually doing that. Only America. Whether it was the former Soviet Union or the, the Chinese regime that followed the Soviet Union regime or the Western European countries, none, or including Japan or South Korea, none of them is doing that. Only America is doing that. And in my view, that approach 
simply doesn't work. The other thing is that in this country, we have too much kind of liberal, uh, new, just a reform uh, going on in the mathematical education uh, field that people constantly bring new concept or progressive, sometimes even agenda to math education. And especially today, influenced by political uh, agendas. So in those countries, that's probably in some of the country in the world today, that's happening, but no country is just like America. We constantly have new ideas. All those teachers, educators, and the students, they don't know what to follow. Every few years, someone will come along to propose something just kind of unheard of. Um, on the other hand, the math education in Asian countries, they are very stable. Okay, uh, I have already mentioned this, but let me emphasize it again. You have to do a lot of work, homework problems, okay? There's, there's simply no shortcut to that. There's no shortcut to doing homework problems, okay? So let's take a look um, at the Common Core in this system, all right? This is the Common Core website. They claim preparing America standards for success. There's only one word that is incorrect in this phrase, and that is success. I would replace that with failure, and completely failure. It's just, it just a horrific system where our common core math has just brought down generations of Americans. Although common core just started not too uh, long ago, but it's pre uh, president almost the same thing. Americans are just infamously bad at the math. Many adults cannot do even fractions, which is totally absurd. Okay, let's take a look how Common Core's curriculum actually works. So all those are screenshots from that website you just saw, all right? This is grade three. Let's take a look at a particular topic, and that is fraction. You can see that this is the common core grade three curriculum. Fractions is right there. And that means that in this country, you started fraction as early as in third grade. What happened in grade four? Well, this is grade four common core curriculum. If you compare the two, Shoulder by shoulder, they are verbatim the same. There's no difference in terms of the curriculum, right? Word by word, they look exactly the same. So what is going on? That doesn't sound logic, right? Because how can you repeat grade three in grade four without any change? Well, how about grade five? Let's take a look at the grade five curriculum on the common core. Once again, that's exactly the same as grade three or grade four. What is going on there? That's because under the common core theory, you want to learn something every year again and again, but each time you just add a little bit depth. Just a little bit actual content. So in terms of fraction, you start in grade three, grade four, and grade five, you're still learning fraction. How about grade six? Well, this is grade six. Look, the number systems. Apply and extend previous understandings of multiplication and division to divide fractions by fractions. So three years later, you're still trying just to learn how to do multiplication and division with fractions. That's in grade six. How about grade, how about grade seven? You can still see that. Once again, grade seven math here, the number system apply and extend previous understandings of operations with fractions to add, subtract, multiply, and divide rational numbers. 
Essentially, you are still doing arithmetic operations with fractions. From grade three to grade seven, five years, you work on fractions. You know how much time those Asian students will spend on fractions? One semester. They only spend, I believe in China today, they will generally do it either in grade five or grade six. Grade five usually is a, just kind of more advanced curriculum, but they don't learn math this way. They learn fractions once and for all. Only in one grade, and usually it's just one semester, meaning half a year, they study fractions intensively and then move on. So I personally believe that's the right way. And by the way, that's how historically math was taught throughout, you know, Western civilization. Nobody, no country teaches math this way, like in the United States. Okay? And what is the result? The result tells it all. The adults in this country are really, really bad at math. Without a calculator, they cannot do something a second grader in China can do. That, that's a fact. Okay? So, we will not learn math in this common core way. Okay, so math is very important. I already say that. But why? Well, math is the foundation of all sciences, whether it's natural sciences like physics, chemistry, biology, you name it, or social sciences like economics, sociology, psychology, political science. All those sciences, they need math one way or the other. It's a misconception, say, if you study social science like a political science, why do you need math for political science? If you go to some really professional academic journals, they use mathematical models to study political systems. Okay? So math is really foundation for all sciences. As to engineering, that's even more of the case because by definition, engineering needs math. So without math, we really don't have the modern civilizations that we know today. Without math, you won't have physics, you won't have chemistry, you won't have engineering, then you have nothing that you are enjoying today. Whether it's a car, it's a TV, it's a computer, it's a cell phone, even electricity, even the tap water. Without the math, you have none of that. You will essentially go back 2,000 years earlier to have a, just a living standard people of 2,000 years ago enjoyed. Nobody wants to go back to that, right? So, math is super important. And in the future, if you want to just further improve our lives, you really need to be good at the math. Then you can study engineering. Then you can study science. All right? Yes. The NBA players, they are cool. The rock stars, they are cool. But those are entertainment. They don't necessarily make our society to, you know, make advance, to move forward. They are just entertainment. They don't improve our productivity. All right. Can you learn math? Yes, you can. Everyone can. You don't have to be a genius to learn math well. The only thing you need to do is put in enough work. Of course, um, how math is taught to you matters. And that's why we are doing this pilot project. Okay? So, with that much said, I want everybody to understand, maybe you are not convinced right now, but I really want to tell you math is actually fun. If it's not fun, I'm not doing it right here, right now with all of you, right? 
I like to play video game when I was a kid. As a matter of fact, when I was a freshman in college, I played so much video game that I spent all the, the kind of um, the scholarship prize money from one semester. I spent it in like one or two weeks. I spent all that money on video games when I was a freshman college student. But that was short-lived. No passion can compare to something that you really enjoyed. Why math is fun? Think about it. If you like to play video game, if you like to play chess, bridge, or other sports, what do you get? You get some joy, right? You enjoy the thing that you are doing. Why? Because it's either entertaining or in some way challenging, whether it's intellectually challenging or physically challenging, but at the end of the day, you got a lot of joy. That's what happened if you really see the beauty of math. Let's think about it. When you work out a challenging math problem, that kind of feeling of fulfillment of, about yourself, it's unparalleled. Nothing can compare to that. You feel good about yourself. You feel very satisfied about what you can achieve. And you feel smart. So math can be really fun. Of course, if you cannot work out the problem, you might get very frustrated. But that makes it even more fun if you somehow say after struggle half an hour, two hours, or even couple of days, sometimes could be even longer, but when you eventually get there, oh my goodness, that type of feeling, it just, it cannot be described by words, okay? So trust me, once you see the beauty of math, you will really, really enjoy it. But unfortunately, most of kids will never get there because they need some help. And that's why I'm here. I'm here to help you to see the beauty of math. And hopefully more of you will enjoy math. Maybe not tomorrow, not next week, but hopefully once we have worked together enough long, you will see the beauty and you will start enjoying the math. That's my goal. Okay, so what will we do this year? Well, this is a so-called catch-up year for everyone. My, my goal is to help any student in the country to um, somehow just adopt an alternative curriculum to Common Core. So that means that no doesn't matter where you are coming from. Whether you coming from from an excellent school where you are already excelling in math or you are from not so excellent school from a school district where a lot of kids are struggling with math, your teachers are substandard, it doesn't matter where you come from. We will try to help you to catch up. And hopefully with one year under your belt, when you study in the sixth grade in the free Asian math curriculum, the ground has been leveled for everyone. So how can we do that? Well, first we will review what you have learned so far in from kindergarten to grade four. Um, essentially, to be perfectly honest with you, in Common Core, you haven't learned too much. Kind of just, it's never too late to salvage um, uh, the Common Core mass that you somehow um, had to take. So we will revisit, review, and reinterpret. That's very important. We will reinterpret the K to fourth grade math you have learned so far. We will restudy, essentially restudy everything from scratch from a different perspective. So in that way, even you're already an excelling student, I promise you can learn something new, all right? Keep you interested. 
we will run some basic number theory. Uh, this has nothing to do with competition math number theory. So in competition math in this country, say like say the math count or AMC American Math Competition Series AMC eight, they all require to uh, have some number theory knowledge. But we are not doing that type of uh, just a competition math number theory. We will just do some very basic uh, uh, things in preparation for you to study fractions. It's very important to have some number theory uh, uh, background. And we, this is a big deal, all right? So we will learn fractions in this fifth grade extensively. And the goal is that we will learn it and we will be done with it. Not meaning that we will never touch fractions again. Instead, fractions will become part of you. You will use your knowledge about fractions in future studies, algebra and beyond, without ever to just do a makeup, uh, just fix up job on fractions. That's the goal. Whether you can really do that depends on how much time. Even you were not a very strong math student, I promise if you put in enough work this year, the next 30 weeks, you will be good on fractions. Okay? So we will learn fractions in this uh, fifth grade, and we will do a lot of word problems. Okay? One major problem in this country is that when people do word problems, the teachers think that you will eventually use algebra to do the uh, word problem. Well, algebra, which I assume that most of you have not officially learned yet, is a powerful tool, but those word problems exist even before algebra was discovered and invented. Then what did the people do without the algebra? Could they solve the same problem? Yes, they could. So we will try to avoid algebra altogether in this year. We will only use arithmetic method to solve a lot of word problems. The, the good thing about that is that this is a very good exercise on your mathematical uh, understanding of how to read the problem and how to do logical reasoning. And for those same problems, we will revisit them again next year in the sixth grade with algebra. And then you can see, by comparison, you can see how algebra is the power of the tool for solving the same problem you previously felt very difficult. And that illustration, that comparison is important so that you can appreciate what algebra is really about. Okay, so let's start with some very specific examples. A big deal for your study in the future is to understand the number systems. I assume everyone by this time, you have not really officially have not really studied uh, much about numbers beyond uh, positive integers or natural numbers. Yeah, maybe some of you have already learned negative numbers or even some fractions, but I assume that's not generally the case. I don't assume anything of that. Let's take a look at this um, table, okay? This is the multiplication table, right? This is the American version of the multiplication table, or they call it the multiplication facts. So we have to think about two things here. Why we need this? Um, well, Actually, we will talk about this in depth in the next several weeks, why we need a multiplication table. But before doing that, let's take a look at the alternative version of the multiplication table. And this is a typical multiplication table uh, in Chinese schools. So if you happen to be able to read uh, Chinese and Mandarin speak, you'll see that uh, this multiplication table, this is called Chen Ba Biao. Uh, that's the Chinese uh, 
meaning of multiplication table. And you see that this is quite different from what you just saw, right? So what is the difference between the two? On the left-hand side, you have the 10 to 10 table. So all the uh, from 1 to 10, 10 rows, 10 columns, you have exactly 100 cells, which give you the multiplication facts. Let's say uh, 4 times 7 or 8 times 5 and so on. So it's a 10 by 10 table. On the other hand, for the Chinese version of the multiplication table, essentially the same, but this looks quite different. You have 9 columns. And the first column, you only have 9 rows, right? 1 times 1, 1 times 2, and so on, 1 times 9. And in the second column, you have 1 less. This time, it starts with 2. The first multiplicand is 2. 2 times 2, 2 times 3, and so on. So each row, you have 1 less. If you compare the two versions, you can see that the Chinese version of the multiplication table is simpler. You don't have to remember that many cells. What happened? Well, this is because in the Chinese version, they implicitly assume you know, or you don't need to know, you just need to take it uh, with face value. When you have, say, 2 times 4, you don't need to have 4 times 2. Right? You cannot find two times four times two. In the fourth column, you start with four times four. You don't have four times three, four times two, four times one. And that is because the associative law of multiplication is assumed here. So when the Chinese kids try to memorize this table, nobody told them, well, there's an associative law, but they just take it for granted. 2 times 4 is the same as 4 times 2. So you don't have to memorize 4 times 2 once you know how to do 2 times 4. Whether that's a really a kind of just a good thing or bad thing may be subject to debate, but the matter of fact is that the Chinese version is dramatically simpler. And there's one more catch. You see that, and this is significant, right? On the left-hand side, the last row and the last column involves 10 times something, right? Either 10 times 2 or 2 times 10. The last column here, 10, 20, uh, 30, 40, and the, the last row, 10, 20, 30, 40. Is that really necessary? Well, 10 is unique, right? Why, why 10 is unique? Because all the other rows or uh, columns there are single digit numbers from 1 to 9, but 10 is a two digit number. Why do we need that? Well, truth be told, this is not only totally unnecessary, but also confusing. Why is confusing? In a few weeks, we will learn why we need to memorize this table. Because Memorizing a table like this is the foundational requirement for you to do any multiplication without a calculator. Let's talk about it. So let's just say you have a complex multiplication problem. Let's say 400, uh, 948 times 257. How do we do that? Well, you know there's a way called vertical multiplication, right? Well, don't tell me you can just grab a calculator. Yes, if you have a calculator, you can do that, but that's not the math. That's just a machine, right? So if we want to do this, what happened? We will use the vertical multiplication procedure, which is essentially a so-called algorithm to do that. We will have to do seven times a that's 56, so that will be a carry on 5. Then 47, uh, 4 times 7, 28, plus 5, that's 33. You have a carry on 3, so and so on. So you will be able to 
figure out the first row, then similarly, by following the same procedure, you will be able to figure out 5 times 8 40, that's a carry on 4, 4 times 5, that's 20 plus 4, 24, and so on. You will get the second row. And finally, you will get the last row by doing um, one digit at a time, multiplication, then get three rows, and you add them up. And this is um, another interesting thing. When you do addition, what do you need to do? Well, let's do it, right? Six, you don't need to do anything. Let's just copy down three plus zero, that's three. Now you have six, four, six, probably you will be able to see that 6 plus 4 is 10, 10 plus 6, that's 16. So you will have a carry on. You have a 1 here. And you have to do actually now 4 numbers, 6, 7, 9, and 1 carry on. You will be able to figure out how to do addition here. You can easily see that uh, the total would be 23. But a sh uh, easier way, probably you want to combine 1 and 9, then carry on 1 with 9 together because they add up to 10. Then 6 plus 7 is 13, plus 10, that's 23. So you have a carry on 2, and that will give you 4 plus 8, that's 12, plus 2, that's 14. So eventually you will get this. All right? This will work for any complicated multiplication. Two numbers multiplied together. So what happened here? No matter how big those two numbers are, maybe a lot of tedious steps, but eventually you will get it done. The very reason you can do this without memorizing too much information is because you memorize the multiplicate table. Okay, either version. The two versions are essentially the same, but if you don't memorize the multiplication table, then every time when you encounter something like a four times seven, what is that? You don't have further, say, a mini multiplication table for you to do, to rely on. So if you don't remember what four times seven is, what is 4 times 7? Let's face it, let's pretend we don't remember what 4 times 7 is. What is 4 times 7? Well, essentially, you either have to add 4 7s together, or you will have to add 7 4 together, right? That's what multiplication really is, if you don't remember what 4 times 7 is. Then you will, but you do remember how to do addition, then you will have to add either version up to get the result 28. That's exactly what we don't want to do. That's why we need to memorize some basic facts. And there's a much deeper reason for that. That has to do with the number, uh, the uh, decimal number system, because we are using the Hindu Arabic decimal number system, which is from 0 to 9, and with place values, that's why you only need to memorize at the bare minimal this Chinese version of the multiplication, multiplication table. And that only involves nine, nine digits from 1 to 9. Because 0 times anything will be 0, so we don't even need to include zero into the picture, that's the bare minimum you have to memorize in order to be able to use this vertical multiplication algorithm to compute any multiplication, no matter how big the numbers are. This looks trivial, but mathematically, it's actually a very deep concept. Because once you have this, multiplication table, you will convert an arbitrarily complex problem into a finite step of much simpler mathematical calculations. All you need to do is to memorize this table, 
not knowing how to do addition. You don't need to memorize something beyond that. To appreciate what it means, take a look at this multiplication chart. I know in some countries like in India, they ask kids to do a extended multiplication table. So they will memorize things like, a, what is 11 times 11? Well, that's a good thing. 11 squared, that's 121. But mathematically, that's an unnecessary thing. Because once you memorize the basic multiplication table from 1 to 9, you will always be able to calculate what 11 times 11 on the fly. Also, if you memorize that, what 11 squared is, that's really good. If you do competition math, it will save you some time, but it's totally unnecessary from computation perspective. You don't really need to memorize that. So for extending the multiplication table like this, the last three rows, two, I include the last 10 rows, uh, and last three columns, they are totally unnecessary, okay? So um, we will actually learn all of this later uh, to be more specific. In the next several weeks, we will have a overhaul of your arithmetic operation addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, all from a different perspective. But that's very important to not to go that fast. Let's go back to some very basic concept. And that is, what are numbers, all right? And what we are looking at is something super important in mathematical study and I think it will be really beneficial for you to just get to know it early on. And what we are seeing is a line, right? This is a line. This is called a number line. And what is it? Well, what is a line? A line is a geometric con concept, which you have not learned yet. But we all know what a line is in life. Right? Let's just say you have a table, you have a rectangle table, um, a table edge, it looks like a straight line. Or if you go fishing, you will see that when, when your uh, fishing line is stretched, it's just a kind of stretched into, uh, there's no stack there, then the line looks like a straight line. Or if you have a laser pointer, you see the beam is really like a straight line. But what is exactly straight line? Well, as it turns out, when you learn geometry, um, in our plan, free Asian math curriculum, you will learn geometry, real geometry, very early. As soon as in the second half of your sixth grade, we will start, start learning real Euclidean geometry. And the first thing you will learn is about the concept of point and the line. And as it turned out, we will not actually rigorously define what a line is. And we will explain why uh, later. But essentially, we will just describe what a line is rather than define what it is. What do we mean by explain what a line is? We will describe what properties a line should have. So when you have a line, what do you think about that? Well, a line should have infinitely many points, right? By that, you can see that what is a point? A point is something that is so tiny, essentially, it does not have any length or width. But if you have, say, a point has some length or width, it must be zero. But what do we mean by zero length? Well, that's really an abstract concept. If you look at this line, you just imagine you have a life, a knife, which is a magic life. It's so sharp that its blade, it can just cut into a line with an infinitely small length. And by that, we essentially mean zero. 
So, if you don't believe me, think about this line. How many points are on this line? Is it 1,000? 10,000? 1 million? 1 billion? The answer is that you have infinitely many points on this line. Why? Let's just say you can identify 1 billion points on this line. You number each of them. But did they occupy the whole line? Apparently not. Because you can put 1 billion points on this line, no matter how big that number is, it's a finite number, right? After you label all of them, you can always find a gap between any two adjacent points. Let's just imagine if we have a line here. This is a line. We put two arrowheads just to denote that the line can be extended in either direction indefinitely. So it's not a finite line segment. That's why we put two arrows here. But let's just say you have one building point on this line. Just take mark all of them down. That's one building. It's a big number, huge number, actually. But once you have put all of them down, did they occupy the whole line? Apparently not. Let's just say you have a magnifier. You blow the line up. You blow up any portion um, of this line. Uh, and then you blow it up. You take a, just like a, almost like a microscope. You take a look. Then you will see that no matter how many points you put there, any two adjacent points, let's just say this is a one point, and this is the next point, they may be very close to each other, but once you blow it up, you will see that there's a distance between the two points, right? How long is that distance? It's actually irrelevant. Maybe it's just one millimeter, maybe it's just 10,000 times smaller, but the point is that those two points are adjacent to each other, there's no further point between those two. So this tiny, tiny segment, how many points on that small portion of the line? Even say this is just one micrometer, how many points there? Can you put one building points onto these small line segments? You definitely can. Just like you put the first one building point down, you can just put one building point within that tiny, tiny portion of the line. And you can repeat this process again and again. So the point is that no matter how dense those points you put it down, this line, you can never fill it up with a finite number, one billion, one trillion. I don't even know how to say the next, just a big number. It just, you can never fill it up with a finite number of lines. So, this line has infinitely many points, but is that enough? No. Even you have infinitely many points, that doesn't mean that this line is really a line in the sense that it has no hole. A line, our understanding, our agreement about what a line is, is this line has no hole. Let me give you an example where a line can have infinitely many points, but it has a lot of holes. And that's a very simple example, okay? So just look at this first um, uh, the figure in the above. This is a, a number line where we put all the integers, including the negative integers. We have not formally introduced what negative integers are, but just think about it. On this line, we have point we mark as zero. Then on the right hand side of this point zero, we have one, two, three, four, all the numbers you know. And the important thing is that the distance between 0 and the 1 is exactly the same the distance between 1 and the 2 
and between two and three. In other words, all the tiny intervals you see here, not only in this blue portion, meaning the right hand side of zero, but also the red portions, that means that between negative one and negative two, all those intervals are of the same length. That's a very important fact. But just assume that we can do this. Can we do this indefinitely in both directions? Of course, we can do this. One, two, three, four. You keep just adding points to this line. When we do this, you essentially put all the integers, positive or negative, onto this line. How many in total? Infinite. Have infinite many numbers there. But did we fill up the whole line? Apparently not, because we only put integers. Let's just say between 1 and 0, in this first blue interval, there's a big gap right there. For this interval, we only have two points at the end, right? At the end, y is 0, y is 1. What happened in between? Well, just like we explained, for this length is 1, let's call that a length between 0 and 1, because that's what we understand to be 1. In this unit length interval, how many points are there? Yeah, infinite many. So this gives the example, say, even you have infinite many points on this line, but those points do not necessarily build up the whole line. There are still potentially a lot of points that you have not even looked at yet. But when we say this number line as a line, we assume there's no hole, okay? Meaning that it's so perfectly dense, once again, let's just imagine that you have an um, ideal life. Maybe Harry Potter gave you that magic life. The life is so sharp, its blade has zero length. So you take a cut on this line. What happened? Whenever you take a cut on this line, that life, we say it's infinitely thin blade, it will cut into one and exactly one point on this line. However, the important thing is that wherever you can choose no matter uh, where you go, whenever you make a cut, it will hit a point that is already on the line. You will never hit a point, something like, if we have this line here, if I deliberately mark a point, say, this point, I stipulate this particular point is not part of this line. It does not belong to this line. What happened, essentially, you can use like a circle to mark this point. This is the hole. If that's the case, this line will have a hole. In that case, if you use this magic line cut right into this position of the line, you will hit a point that does not belong to this line. And in that sense, we say this line has a hole. And if that's indeed the case, this line is not the line we want to have. It's a defective line. So in other words, when we say we have a line, we assume we don't have any hole like this whatsoever. This line is perfectly dense. No matter where you make a cut, you will never run into a situation where you hit a point and that point does not belong to this line. And if that's the case, we really think this is the line we all agree to be what is a line. All right? So this is a very important uh, concept, but it requires a lot of deeper mathematics to understand it. Uh, of course, in fifth grade, we don't want you to go that far. This is a very kind of intuitive understanding of what a line is, but this is important. Why? Because this is what we will call a number line. Okay, so um, it's 5.30. We will try to be on time every uh, lecture. Um, 
apparently lecture is just part of what you need to do. Uh, in fact, good math students do not need to learn everything from lecture. All you need is some good reading materials. Well, I'm writing something for you to read. So part of your homework is to read the handout. You will get the first set of homework tonight. And before that, every lecture, after every lecture, I will try to give you some fun YouTube video to watch. I will try to limit the total length to be under 20 minutes. So sometimes it could be two or even three short videos, but sometimes it could be one longer video, like 15 minutes of videos. I already screen and the bad roast videos try to find the better ones for you. And I will try to avoid all those boring, dreary videos. Something that won't put you into sleep, right? So uh, try to do all the homework. Try to watch the YouTube videos I will give to you. And most importantly, you will have a very positive attitude. You really need to spend time on this thing. Cut, if that means cut down your video time, do it. I will give you the handout uh, right after this. I expect everybody to read from just cover to back. Each time the set of handouts just a few pages, not excessive, but I do want to read it, all right? Um, I appreciate your being here. So our next lecture will be on Friday, same time, and same uh, YouTube channel here. And I will see you next on Friday. Thank you. Bye.